Our next speaker is Adel Ahmadian, who is here. Yes. He has a PhD from UIUC and um, has been working over the years on, on various different computer vision projects. He um, is now a researcher at Google and has been working on pose estimation, tracking, and um, maybe most notably in this context, he is also uh, one of the creators of the Objectron dataset, which he will be talking about in uh, the next presentation. You can start sharing your screen if that works. I'm trying to share this screen. Let me try it again. Wonderful. Can you see my screen? Yes, everything works. Perfect. All right. Uh, thanks, Noah, uh, for the connection between the cathedral and Objectron. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the Objectron project that we did uh, over the last year, and its connection to 3D object understanding. This is a work uh, with my co-workers, uh, Langfai Artsy and Johnny and Matthias at Google. So at Google, our goal is to organize the world's information. And for us, everything starts with that search box. So when you search for an object, like for example, an IKEA chair, we are very good at figuring out what you're searching for, like what you want to see. And the web is like a treasure trove of images. Like we're also very good at figuring out, hey, these are all the images of this object that you care about. So when we have all of these images, uh, and all of them are from multiple views, it becomes very natural to start thinking about, can we build like a 3D model out of this search query? And this would help us with a lot of the problems that we wish to solve, including like pose estimation, what are the sizes, uh, can we have a different views of the same object and so on. So from this perspective, unsupervised 3D object understanding is very valuable to our products and our goal. Uh, before I talk about object on project, I want to plug a bunch of the models that we make, uh, namely the object on solutions. Uh, we build these tiny and very fast small models uh, that they can estimate the 3D pose of an object. Uh, and we put this on every device you can imagine. Like uh, you can run them on your mobile, uh, on the web, via Python, or even you can deploy them on Edge. And if you want to like use them in your product or you want to use them in your course project, uh, it would be very happy to help. So going back to the to the un object understanding problem, uh, recall that our goal is to understand the 3D pose or uh, 3D shape from a still image, from a still monocolor RB RGB image. But this is a very, very diff difficult problem to solve. And Namely, understanding 3D from 2D images is, is difficult. Uh, we were looking for a way to boost the 3D signal in these images. And there are a lot of ways you can do this. Like uh, many folks, they would incorporate different priors. Uh, they would use the stereo images, a structural light, or motion. Uh, we opted to use motion. And that's how you get, you go from still images to object-centric videos. Like we were thinking, like, if you have a video of object, and you're looking at it from a different views, it would help understanding 3D better. And this also matches nicely with the way that we as a human would also make progress in understanding 3D. Like for example, there was this uh, example I heard a long time ago that when you are a kid and you want to like learn what is an object, like what is a chair, you would crawl around it, you would try to look at it from different perspectives. But when you are an old man, you just look at it and you're trying to recall it from your knowledge. So we went from still images to object-centric videos, and that is essentially the object on data set. So in order to help with the 3D object understanding, we created this large data set. And 
one thing that is shared in this data is this it's a collection of videos and they're all object centric like they would look at the same object from different views and we have annotated the pose for this and we also have the camera poses of big poses AR point cloud and stuff like this we try to make this very easy and accessible uh, for both researchers and industrial applications so if you want to use it in your pipeline it is super easy there are a bunch of different wrappers and notebooks and everything and for different tasks for example if you want to use it for 3d pose estimation and we also have a really good uh, evaluation metrics like 3d iu that you can evaluate the, your models and compare it with the state of the art overall we roughly uh, collected about 50,000 videos and that translates to about 4 million annotated images in nine different categories and these categories they range from small objects uh, like cups and shoes to relatively large ones like chairs and bicycles. There are deformable objects and uh, rigid ones like uh, you have both bikes and you have cameras. And there are objects with symmetries that makes the problem kind of difficult, uh, for example, cups and bottles. So when we wanted to collect this, the very first problem that we had was how can we do this at the scale? Like we didn't want to have like a small data set of like 10 or 100. We want to have a data set of thousands of videos and images. And when you want to collect something at a scale, the easiest way is to use, to use devices that everyone has. In this case, for us, it was a phone. So we went and we asked our data collector to use their phone we collect a video of the object. So it has its upside and downsides. The upside is it is easy to deploy to the 10 countries and five continents, and we could just uh, do this at a very early rapidly. Also, all the, if your application is developed for phone, you're in distribution of the our model. Like you have, you're looking at this, it's like the same type of videos that you get from the phone. Uh, but if you want to like deploy it on a different devices, then you might have some shift in the distribution. To annotate this, uh, remember all of our videos, they, ha they have a 3D pose of the object. Uh, we opted to use this annotation in 3D, where our annotators would put a 3D bounding box in one frame, and they would look at the different frame, and they would try to adjust it, as shown in the figure on the right. One specific thing about our data set is because it was collected on the phone, during the recording of the video, we also collected the AR session metadata. And this is those Islam algorithms that you run on device, for example, like AR kit or AR core. And they provide a very ac really accurate camera pose that is in meters. Because they have an accelerometer, they can record the pose in a scale. So all of the our bounding boxes, they are actually at the correct scale. So this would look, uh, for example, these are the example of uh, samples that we have in our data set for the category chairs. Uh, all of these 3D bounding boxes are very well sticky. And they're very, very accurate. When we say accurate, uh, it is very hard to measure the accuracy of the ground truth. Uh, in order to have confidence in the, how accurate and good our annotations are. Uh, we, for some uh, videos, we ask 10 different annotators to annotate the same video and then we measure the variance. And for a class of chair, uh, this variance is uh, under 2% of the scale. So we can confidently say that these annotations are relatively accurate. The videos that we collected, the, we had two properties. One, we wanted this video to be like essentially 360 views of the object. When we say 360 views, uh, there's an asterisk that this is a 360 view of the upper hemisphere. What does it mean is all of these are a camera. Like these are the phone camera. And usually when people collect, it, collect a video with the phone camera, they hold it at a 45 degrees angle. 
So this pops up as a heavy bias in the elevation of the data set. And this is not just common to object on. Uh, other data sets that are collected by videos or through YouTube, they would have the same elevation bias. This is just something to be aware of. Our elevation is heavily biased toward 45 degrees, and the azimuth of the object, uh, they pretty much cover the entire TCC views. So I'm going to talk about two applications that uh, we try to provide as baseline for the object. One is 3D pose estimation, and the other one is 3D construction. And if you come up with a new application for it, I'm all ears. So for 3D object detection, uh, we had we came up with this very, very simple baseline model that we use the efficient net to extract features, and then we add a fully connected and then a regression layer to regress the XY key point of the 3D pounding box. And then it is followed by a EPNP to lift this XY key points to 3D. And that would give us a 3D pounding box. So this baseline model, it works reasonably well. Now you can see some examples on the right side here. And we wanted to be able to evaluate this. Uh, Evaluation, there are different ways to do this, and you can refer to the update on papers for different metrics. The most interesting one that we have is a 3D IOU. So 3D IOU, intersection over union, it's usually in the 3D literature, it is approximated. So we try to come up with an algorithm that would uh, compute it very, very accurately. And we thought, okay, we have two bounding boxes, and we want to compute the intersection of it. How can we do that? As it turns out, if we rotate one bounding box to become axis aligned, the other bounding boxes, there's a well-known algorithm in computer vision, in computer graphics uh, called polygon clipping, that lets you find the clip the second bounding box with the first one. And this is actually used in a lot of game engines, like uh, when you have a view and you want to render the word around you in that view, you don't want to render the word that are outside the view of the camera. So you clip the word outside and you just keep the one that's inside. And the same output can be used for 3D IU. So we intersect the different faces for the polygon uh, with the axis aligned one, and then we compute the intersection with the convex hall. This output has some caveat for symmetric objects because with symmetry, you cannot really estimate that symmetric and that symmetric axis very well, right? For example, when you look at a cup, what is the front face of the cup? Uh, it is ill-defined in this case. And for these cases of symmetric object, we just rotate it uh, and get like multiple instances and we pick the one that produces the minimum. So with this 3D IOU, for example, you can see like uh, what would be like the baseline results for different models across uh, different categories. And these results, uh, at the time that I'm, uh, we are talking at this ICCB, like uh, this is not the state of the art anymore. Like uh, some new folks have come up with a better model that would beat these numbers. Uh, everybody's talking about NERF. So we are not an exception here either. We love NERF. Uh, I mean, if you have object-centric videos, it adapts well to the whole nerve uh, infra and pipeline. And object run is, is not an exception. Like, uh, you can train nerve model on object run. What's interesting for us is we actually use nerve for generating novel views that are missing in the data set. As I mentioned earlier, like uh, our data set in is heavily biased towards specific views in elevation. And NERF can actually help us uh, avoid those biases. Like we can generate views that are typically not in the data set. Uh, the second application of it is it gives us a depth map. And the depth map is, gives us a very, very sharp depth map, even to my own surprise. And these depth maps are not in the data set, but we can use it. An uh, interesting thing about NERF is we also like uh, have a 3D bounding box. And if you call the, the depth map, even that 3D bounding box, you get a segmentation mask essentially for free. 
Now, there are some caveats. Uh, like, we, we assume that there are no other objects in that volume of the 3D bounding box except the object that we care, we care about. And this is true mostly for many of like, the images in the bounding box, uh, images in the object on data set. The, there are also some trickery going on to remove the ground plane from the data set. And those hacks would actually help you improve the segmentation. So thank you so much. Uh, if you want to get a data set or some examples of it, uh, you can refer to our website. And if you want to download the pre-trained model, you can uh, use media pipe the framework for running in front of some of the devices. Thanks a lot. That Any was questions? a very interesting and comprehensive overview of the object from data set. While people are thinking about questions, I have one question about the last part that you presented. You showed that NERF can um, give you novel views. And then an immediate question is, have you tried um, basically supplementing your training data for your pose estimation with these uh, NERP views to see if that improves the, the detection performance. Uh, that's right, uh, yeah. So there are two things. Uh, one is we can, for example, when we are training our models, uh, especially the production model, we try to normalize our views for like, uh, so our data set is breaking down into many parts, uh, and they are classified into different views. Like we have a top view of the object, side views of the object, and so on. And we can actually use this. Uh, we have some prototype of it that we augment the, those missing views using this technique. The other one is uh, like when we have some objects that are only having like, a limited number of views, so, and you want to like interpolate those between views from them, again, never would be a good way to augment the data set. The downside of it is like a training F model that it can take, can take a while, so this is a very really expensive process. Yes, thanks. That's, that's very interesting. Are there any more questions in the two different chats that we have? does not look like it. Then thank you very much for thank your you presentation. So much.